Hi there, I'm the MythKeeper. Welcome back to my channel. This week, we're doing a new series. We're talking about the planar cosmology of Pathfinder. In this first video, I'm going to give you a 101 to the planes, and I'm also going to go deep on the transitive planes. In some upcoming videos in this series, I'm going to be talking about the inner planes, I'll do a couple of videos set there, the outer planes, a couple of videos set there, and some of the famous demi-planes, I'll do a video set there as well. This video will be coming out amidst a variety of other videos. Uh, I've sort of figured out the pattern for what's coming here in this series. We're going to be doing regional deep dives every three videos. We're going to be doing more religions, uh, more gods and goddesses, and we're also going to be doing another ancestry video coming out. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But right now, we're going into the planes of Pathfinder, and we've got more information about the transitive planes in this video. Guide to the Planes, Part 1. The Cosmology of the Multiverse and the Transitive Planes. Just like many role-playing games, in the game of Pathfinder, there is a whole multiverse out there, strange dimensions that extend beyond our own physical universe to places and realities far removed from our own, but which intersect and influence one another in a great and complicated cosmology. I'm going to be using the Planar Adventure Sourcebook from First Edition as my primary resource for this material, but I want to caveat this with the fact that once your adventures drift into planes outside the material universe, you're very much in uncharted territory, for your characters and your players. It's only very rare creatures that traverse planes with any kind of regularity, and even for those that do, it's rare for them to really understand the nature of the realities they are crossing. In short, take all of this material with a grain of salt, and recognize that you really have free reign here to establish your own rules and guidelines to what the experience of moving between realities actually feels like, and what sorts of strange vistas and experiences your player characters may encounter there. Let's start by answering a simple question. What is a plane? Obviously, we're not talking about flying machines here. Mathematically, a plane is a two-dimensional space defined by two lines, with no thickness and no curvature, and infinite width and length. Emergent from this mathematical concept is the idea that many parallel planes, or realities, might exist with infinite scale and size, but never intersecting, like many sheets of paper laid down upon one another. This is the concept we're discussing here. Each plane of the multiverse is one of several realities. Except for rare linking points, each plane is effectively its own universe, and beings within it are blissfully ignorant of their own containment. Each has its own natural laws, fundamental principles, and unique properties, which may make them very different from our own. The planes break down into five types. The material plane, the transitive planes, the inner planes, the outer planes, and the demi-planes. The material plane. The material plane is the most recognizable of all the planes because it is our own. It is our own real-world observable reality, and its scale is so vast that it's hard for humans to really grasp the size of it. But let's try. The material plane is comprised mainly of the vacuum of empty space, and between these vast gulfs of empty darkness there can be found hundreds of billions of galaxies. Among these galaxies are at least three galaxies that we know to have life. The Milky Way galaxy, including the Terran solar system and the planet Earth. Yes, our planet Earth exists canonically in the Pathfinder universe, although present day in the fictional time period the game is set in is about a hundred years ago relative to our own time, so it is currently the 1920s in game world right now. An impossible distance away from this galaxy is Galarian's own unnamed galaxy, and Galarian's own solar system, and of course the world of Galarian itself. The third galaxy referenced to canonically in the Pathfinder world is the location of the planet Androfa, which was the provenance of the crashed alien spacecraft located in the nation of Numeria. In Starfinder, the science fiction setting of the far future of the Pathfinder world, there are many additional habited galaxies identified beyond these three. The point is, there are so many planets, solar systems, and galaxies in the universe that one could never leave the material universe in a million lifetimes and still never fully explore all of it or know the full scope of it. The Inner Planes The inner planes are composed of the basic essences of reality. These include the four elements, air, earth, fire, and water, as well as the two poles of magical energy, life-giving positive energy and life-draining negative energy. In classical cosmological representation, four of those essences, the planes of air, earth, fire, and water, serve as layered shells around the prime material universe, while the planes of positive and negative energy exist as oppositional poles for the inner planes. The inner planes also comprise a couple more unusual realities. 
The first world is a vibrant magnification of the universe, enhanced by its position between the material plane and the positive energy plane, while the shadow plane is a murky reflection of the universe cast against the negative energy plane. The outer planes. The outer planes are composed of a material called quintessence, an essence that is shaped and influenced by the morals and ethics of life and death. The nine alignments define the very nature of the outer planes themselves, as well as the denizens of those planes. These planes include the Abyss, Abaddon, Axis, the Boneyard, Elysium, Heaven, Hell, the Maelstrom, and Nirvana. The Transitive Planes These planes, which include the astral plane and the ethereal plane, share a single important characteristic. Each can be used to travel from one place to another. In addition to those two, which are often used to navigate the planes of existence, another really important transitive plane is the river of souls. Although the true nature of death remains a mystery to the living, it is a cycle as old as existence, responsible for the stability of the planes themselves. It is nothing less than the pulse of the living multiverse, the answer to the questions that haunt both the living and the dead. All are destined to travel this mysterious route at the end and the beginning of their existence. Demiplanes this catch-all category covers all extra-dimensional spaces that function like planes but have measurable size and limited access. While other kinds of planes are theoretically infinite in size, a demiplane might be only a few hundred feet across, a small pocket reality, if you will, often created by powerful magics rather than being a part of the innate substructure of the multiverse. A deeper look into the transitive planes. For my first video on the planes, I'm going to focus on those planes that permit travel through the multiverse. I'm talking about the transitive planes. Specifically, I will be going deep on the River of Souls, the Boneyard, the Astral Plane, and the Ethereal Plane. Let's start with the River of Souls. And to understand this transitive plane, we must first take a closer look at mortals, the inhabitants of the material universe. Although we think of mortal beings as confined to the material plane, in a way, every living creature that has ever existed begins their existence as a result of a transition between the planes. As a part of their fetal development, a fraction of power drawn from the positive energy plane fills them with vitality. This power is called a soul, an invisible metaphysical energy that provides motivating force to mortal beings. According to the teachings of Irori, and he's likely not wrong, as he is a god who understands the nature of personal existence above maybe all others, a mortal sense of self after birth is always triune in nature, comprising of a mix of the physical body, the intellectual mind, and the spiritual soul. These three are inextricably linked, and when they become separated, such as during death, that unique entity ceases to exist, although a part of them may continue. That unique entity may also recur if the body and spirit are reunited, such as during resurrection. In any case, over the course of a mortal's life, sentience, experience, and outside influences realign a soul's innate neutrality towards extremes of law, chaos, good, or evil. Souls retain the personality and memories of a mortal life for a period, though these fade over time and through transitions into other states. Mortals who have experienced death often describe the experience as a feeling of floating or lifting, being drawn towards a misty ribbon of light, or being swept up in an indistinct crowd. Some remember glimpses of unfamiliar faces and bits of conversations with strangers, accompanied by a sense of timelessness. But even those returned to life after centuries have little sense of what they were doing, or how they occupied themselves during that time. Metaphysically, though, what happens upon a mortal's death is not so vague. Death severs the connection between a mortal's body and its soul. The body becomes inert material, while the soul manifests nearby upon the ethereal plane, either invisibly or as just one more indistinct form in that ghostly realm. In most cases, the unfettered soul departs the body, proceeding to its journey along the river of souls. Eventually, this progression reaches the boneyard, the plane of absolute neutrality. There, psychopomps and emissaries from the various planes ensure that the newly arrived dead make their way towards the courts of the goddess Phrasma. Each in turn, souls have the deeds of their lives scrutinized, considered, and recorded by the goddess's servants. Those with clear destinations in the afterlife, such as those devoted to a specific deity or clearly aligned with a particular plane, are easily sorted towards their eternal fates. Some souls aren't spoken for by deities, however. 
Rather than going to the realms of specific divinities, the spirits of animists, polytheists, agnostics, and others who don't worship specific divinities are sent to planes best matching their individual alignments and philosophies. The more virtuous souls often find their ways to the good aligned planes, while wicked souls are sent to more evil planes. This isn't a reward or punishment. It is rather an organizing of like souls. A soul's judgment is not always so obvious, though. In some cases, a soul's alignment radically differs from that of the deity it worships. In such cases, Phrasma and her servants employ visions from the soul's mortal life and the powers of the boneyard's courts to determine the greatest influences on the individual's life. Phrasma employs diverse agents to investigate a soul whose fate has come into question, and agents of the opposing deities or planes also make arguments and present evidence in Phrasma's courts. The goddess or her greater agents then rule in the soul's proper destination after which the soul is typically directed to either a deity's realm or a plane of like-minded individuals. Regardless of a soul's final destination, upon receiving Phrasma's judgment, it finds itself changed. The soul is transformed into a petitioner, a true native of the plane it now inhabits. Petitioners are post-mortal beings, and in game terms they are considered outsiders, the catch-all type for any creature not native to the material plane. Once transformed into a petitioner, a soul regains a physical body although not necessarily one similar to that which it had in life. The outer planes are realms of philosophy rather than physicality, and the petitioner's body is formed from the quintessence, charged with the fundamental tenets of its new home. Many petitioners appear as humanoids, or vague shapes with only general similarities to their mortal bodies. Some planes subject petitioners to more radical transformations, like reconstitution into animalistic forms, or script-covered forms, or even maggot-like larvae. The prevailing philosophical forces of a plane itself determine the particulars of the form, with indirect influence based on the soul's personality and experiences. For some, existence as a petitioner is short, but for others, death is just the beginning of a much longer spiritual journey. There are even examples of situations where a post-mortal petitioner has ascended all the way to godhood. This is the case, for example, with the goddess Milani, which I discuss in my Lesser Gods Part 1 video. She was a mortal woman who worshipped Aradin, she died a martyr, and was sent to the last Aslantes domain in Axis. As a petitioner, she became first an angel, and then later became a goddess in her own right after the death of Aradin. She is not considered to be one of the ascended, like her sister Iomede, those humans who became gods directly, because she was already post-mortal once she achieved divinity. A critical detail here is that once a soul has been judged, and transitioned to its new life as a petitioner in the outer planes, they've begun new lives. They can no longer be returned to life by mortal magic. That means if you are planning to cast a resurrection spell on someone in Pathfinder, you do in fact have a limited window with which to do so, although the mechanics for this are left to GM discretion. You need to catch the soul before it progresses beyond the boneyard and has been judged by Phrasma and moved on to its final plane in new life. The window is slightly larger for someone who has led a morally complicated life than for someone who has devoted themselves to a specific deity, but faster is always better when it comes to resurrection. Even if resurrection fails, death is not necessarily the end, as we have seen, as the spirit may one day revisit the material universe, but likely as a very different entity indeed. Ultimately, though, the fate of the vast majority of petitioners in their post-mortal life is the same as the end of their mortal life. All things end in time. Through sacrifice, violent end, or abdication of existence, such beings are eventually destroyed. At that point, their signature quintessence is released to contribute to the power of their home planes. But that, too, is not the end. The river of souls is in fact a great circle. The cycle of life and death that mortal philosophers call the river of souls is best known for the procession of recently deceased souls traveling from the material plane's innumerable worlds to the boneyard to be judged. But another, less well-documented river, referred to as the Antipode, carries the recycled energies of planar quintessence back to the positive energy plane. Now, I open this section by claiming that souls come from the positive energy plane. That was, in fact, a simplification. The truth proves more complex. Amid the searing light and unbridled energy of the positive energy plane drift sparks of formless, unaligned quintessence, much of which is brought there by the Antipode. Over time, the positive energy plane infuses this unaligned planar force with its vigor and potential, creating what are, in fact, new unaligned souls, devoid of all will or sentience. Gradually, at focal points and planar vertices, these souls seep from the positive energy plane into realms beyond. 
Many pass through the riotous expanse of the first world, sparking new growth, giving rise to radical changes, and sparking the creation of fey beings in their passage. Souls also breach the material plane and drift throughout the overlying ethereal plane, gravitating towards worlds rich with life. On the material plane, they imbue empty vessels suited to host them. Thus the cycle begins anew. In the billions of years of living existence, who knows how many times individual quintessence has passed through the full cycle of creation, from mortal life to judgment to post-mortal life to deconstruction to reconstitution to rebirth. Finally, let's go back to that point of judgment. I should add that not all souls leave the boneyard, the place where most would typically wait judgment. Perfectly neutral souls are allowed to seek peace and equilibrium in the solitude of the plain, while worshippers of Phrasma remain in the goddess's court, directing new arrivals from the material plane and serving her psychopomp ushers. Let's go a little bit deeper into this place. The Boneyard. The Boneyard, also sometimes called Purgatory, the House of Dust, or the Spire Lands, sits atop an impossibly tall and constantly growing spire. Home to the goddess Phrasma and her court, the Boneyard serves as a beacon and destination for the River of Souls, from which the souls of the recently deceased arrive at the plain's edge and join enormous lines that wind through the realm, awaiting their final judgment to determine their place within the great beyond. For all its size and prominence, Verasma's court makes up only a small portion of the spire lands. The majority of the plain consists of vast territories, reminiscent of environments in the material plain. Determined travelers who overcome the boneyard system for preventing accidental egress can also traverse the length of the spire itself, a massive rock face riddled with yawning archways that lead into spiraling tunnels and staircases. Explorers have found truly bizarre relics in these shattered passageways, leading some to believe the spire is what remains of a previous reality that has since ended. The origins of the spire are shrouded in mystery. Some legends speak of Phrasma creating the boneyard and its spire herself while others claim that the spire's existence predates the goddess. Phrasma does not answer questions regarding the spire, but if anyone knows the truth, it's her. The Boneyard is the land of the dead, and the most populous inhabitants of this plain are the souls of the recently deceased, as they stand in line, patiently awaiting their judgment. The Boneyard, placed as it is, in the metaphysical and philosophical center of the great beyond, sees far more interplanar traffic than any other plane, with visitors from the abyss, heaven, and everywhere in between traveling to purgatory on missions as diverse as the visitors themselves. Denizens of the Boneyard include Phrasma. Phrasma is the dominant deity within the Boneyard, ruling over birth, death, and fate from her throne within her palace. She is a dispassionate goddess, making no assertions that either fate or death is just or otherwise, and she holds no strong relationships with other deities. She is a dispassionate goddess, making no assertion that either fate or death is just. Arguably the most powerful and ancient of all the gods, although some evidence suggests the outer gods, like Azathoth, Nyarlathotep, or Yogsothoth, are even more ancient. Phrasma rules the boneyard with utter and complete authority. Nonetheless, she is not the only divinity to dwell upon this plane. Grotus. Beyond Phrasma, the most significant deity of the boneyard is the god Grotus, who drifts above the spirelands in the form of a distant skull-faced moon. Grotus remains an enigma, appearing in the writings of unknown pantheons of gods scattered across the crypts of the graveyard of souls, suggesting that he is among the eldest of the gods. Grotus's slow orbit around the boneyard is not stable, and its constant decay brings his grim countenance closer and clearer by the day. At certain points in his descent, however, he halts and withdraws to a greater distance. Legend has it that on the day that Grotus finally collides with the boneyard, the end of days will be upon the great beyond, and all that is dead and living alike will cease to be. Achekek the mantis god Achekek, patron of assassins and divine punishment, is unique among the divinities in that he is the sole known deific inhabitant of the spire itself. His is an immense realm called the Blood Veil, carved into the spire's base. Achekek keeps no relations with other deities, for at times he is called upon to assassinate those who step beyond their bounds. His relationship with Phrasma is a strange and curious one, not well understood even by those who worship either of the deities. Psychopomps Beyond the divinities, the most common outsiders within the boneyard are psychopomps, stoic stewards and guides for the departed souls. Psychopomps do not cause mortal death, but seek instead to ensure that a deceased soul's judgment and journey to its ultimate afterlife proceeds smoothly. 
This is a far from simple task, as psychopomps often have to battle marauding predators that feed upon hapless souls, locate confused or rebellious spirits who attempt to flee their fate, or deal with those who would subvert the natural order with soul-binding magic or necromancy. They also serve as respected neutral parties, as they work with denizens of many planes equally, and disperse judge petitioners out into the great beyond. The mysterious pantheon of demigods who rule over the psychopomps are known collectively as the Ushers. They serve for Asma directly, an aider in sorting the dead, defending the boneyard, and overseeing the lesser members of their race. They keep their own domains in the boneyard, typically relatively small divine realms that rarely encompass more than a single sprawling castle, manor, or necropolis. Among the psychopomp ushers, Barzak the Passage is the one most newcomers in the boneyard encounter first, for he is tasked with keeping vigil over the comings and goings of visitors to Phrasma's domain. He carries a tombstone and key that, when used together, can lock or unlock a soul's memories so that a creature may retain them upon passage to the afterlife or forget what it is they have learned. Crypt Dragons The boneyard is also the home plane of crypt dragons. These creatures emerge from nests of tombstones and skulls within the graveyard of souls and often seek out layers in the material plane. There, crypt dragons claim the dead as both their horde and their subjects. A creature's earthly remains are treated as precious treasure, and a creature's soul is considered to be under the dragon's protection. Crypt dragons even go so far as to escort favored souls through the astral plane, and representing them in Phrasma's court. Eons Eons are outsiders native to the astral plane, but they can also frequently be encountered in the boneyard. They often use the boneyard as a staging point for their own missions through the plains, and in many cases have understandings with Phrasma or her agents to use the various portals found throughout the boneyard to facilitate such travels. Speaking of eons, it's time to move on. The Astral Plane Also called the Silver Sea, a seemingly endless expanse of silver mist, the Astral Plane connects all realities and provides the substructure for the River of Souls. The planes of the outer sphere move around slowly upon a matrix of metaphysical material known as the astral plane, much as tectonic plates coast upon a planet's liquid mantle. This plane may seem to be an empty expanse of faint shimmering silvery clouds, yet astral space is a diffuse realm of colliding philosophies, eternally echoing thoughts, quintessential detritus, and undreamt ideas. Dispersed, these particles are barely perceptible. However, the plane of fire at the astral plane's heart churns the silvery sea with its physical and metaphysical heat, sending roiling currents coiling outwards to eventually brush against the outer planes in a form of cosmic convection. As these currents collide, so too do concepts, legends, and raw quintessence, drawing in more and more material to form new islands of solidity, or even entire demi-planes. Those new locales birthed near an outer plane often absorb that realm's ideals, whereas those spawned far from other planes can manifest the unspoken principles of nearby creatures. Cosmic convection by the plane of fire is not the only force to stir the astral plane. The river of souls courses through the sea, in a spiraling whirl imperceptible to most, yet the movement of souls is as powerful as any oceanic current for those with the tools to harness it. Likewise, the antipodal flow cascades back to the inner sphere in an opposing spiral, carrying the pulverized quintessence of the outer planes back to the positive energy plane to fuel the cycle of souls. Both metaphysical rivers attract the attention of opportunists, be they demons and night hags hoping to snatch stray souls, or enterprising wizards and cosmic filter feeders harvesting the antipode's limitless potential, ultimately consuming mere drops from a deluge. For most, the astral plane is merely a transitive plane, a means of reaching more desirable destinations, be it via teleportation or traveling through the Silver Sea. However, those who call this realm home live and die here, all the while contesting with the plane's timeless quality. Such denizens of the astral plane include astral dragons, exiled titans called danavas, psychic elemental creatures called psychomentals, immaculately birthed quintessent spawnings called the Shining Children, and the serpent beasts of divine creation and destruction called the Ouroboros, among many other rare creatures. The more common denizens of the astral plane, however, include eons. The multiverse may sustain itself for the cycle of souls, yet there are so many moving parts that could fall out of alignment in that system that as a whole it requires constant maintenance. The inscrutable eons serve this role. 
The astral plane is not only their highway for reaching the far corners of the cosmos, but also where they originate. Eons are birthed from the philosophical collisions that occur at the connection points between outer planes. Eons seem to have an innate sense of purpose, and most eons disperse to wherever they're needed in the multiverse. The astral plane's relatively high concentration of eons is due almost exclusively to their creation here and to their use of the realm for transportation. The only eons who are otherwise regularly found on the plane are the Bythos, guardians of time and planar travel. These cloud-like beings vigilantly patrol the astral plane, watching for those who would create dangerous connections between the planes or who would exploit the plane's timeless quality and connectivity to distort the flow of time. The Elohim. The powerful Elohim are virtually silent about their origins, yet they are the source of life on countless worlds. The prevailing hypothesis is that the gods created the Elohim as impartial servitors, who were cast aside after they worked on the first draft of creation, the first world. No matter their original purpose, Elohim today predominantly inhabit the astral plane. There they build new demiplanes, seeded with never-before-seen species, and possibilities, before departing to begin the process elsewhere. They also created the astral plane's other most populous native people, the Shulsaga. While many Shulsagas have since spurned their creators, others believe that by attaining a truly enlightened state, a Shulsaga can transcend its simple form and metamorphose into a new Elohim. Enduring Shulsaga tales of their paragons support this idea. However, Elohim's dwindling numbers suggest otherwise, that Elohim are on the path to extinction. Shulsagas. Shulsagas are a native people that dwell in the astral plane and act as planar shepherds to young demiplanes, departing each demiplane in their care only once they're certain it has coalesced completely. Although the spindly Shulsagas are among the more anthropomorphically relatable species native to the astral plane, they rarely welcome visitors. Their isolationist preferences aren't just for their own peace, but more importantly for the sake of their charges, the nascent demiplanes that they guard. Casual travelers often describe Shulsagas as hunters, though as outsiders on a timeless plane, these creatures have virtually no need for conventional sustenance. Instead, their tracking, territorial behavior, and ability to sense planar rifts ensure that their adopted nurseries remain sacrosanct. Astral Leviathans The astral plane's greatest wanderers are astral leviathans. Massive, whale-like beings with asymmetrical eyes, a multitude of overlapping jaws, and warped, skinless muscles. Astral leviathans require little sustenance, even without the plane's timeless trait, but prioritize variety in their diet. This drives them to open rifts, where food particles or even hapless creatures might fall into the Silver Sea. Like elephants seeking water, astral leviathans have an unerring sense of where they've been before and what they can find there. The nomadic Shosagas value, befriend, and recruit leviathans as traveling companions. The immense beasts in turn appreciate Shosaga's companionship and ability to sense nearby planar breaches where the leviathans might sample some new cuisine or culture. The goddess Alceta. Although the astral plane is often traveled by divinities or used as a neutral meeting ground, very few divinities keep realms in the Silver Sea. One notable exception, however, is the goddess Alceta, patron of doors, transitions, and years. Her presence is therefore felt all over the material universe and she serves often as a servitor to other gods and an arbiter to their disputes when they meet on the astral plane. The ethereal plane. Also called the in-between and the space between spaces, the ethereal plane is a misty veil laid over existence, a ghostly world that connects all of the inner planes on a subconscious level. To go back to our previous analogy, if the astral plane is the liquid mantle on which the outer planes rest as disparate tectonic plates, then the ethereal plane is the atmosphere of the multiverse poured over the top of our metaphorical planet, the common air breathed by all who dwell there. Of all the transitive planes, the ethereal plane is the closest to the material plane, though it is still unreachable without potent magic. Those with the power to step through find the veiled existence of ethereality to be useful indeed. Ethereal creatures can perceive objects, terrain, and creatures on the material plane as wispy, ghost-like images, but are themselves invisible to all on the material plane, save for the supernaturally gifted. The ability to move through solid objects on the material plane gives an ethereal traveler incredible mobility. While traveling on the ethereal plane, a creature is insubstantial, invisible, and utterly silent to someone on the material plane. While it is most often used by mortals as a means to move incorporeally and unseen, the ethereal plane also serves as the launching point for souls, 
for it is here that they drift to upon death, joining the river of souls to begin their journey to the boneyard. Not all souls succeed at this journey, however. The ethereal plane is receptive to potent emotion, and souls that died without finding peace may linger in the mists for a time. Souls that become lost or are unable to move on due to extreme emotional trauma at the time of their death may return to the material plane as ghosts, specters, wraiths, or other bodiless undead. Despite its barren emptiness, the ethereal plane is not uninhabited. The most notorious of its denizens are the Zills, blood-red planar marauders with the power to step into the material plane and abduct creatures to serve as living hosts for their eggs. These alien outsiders have tyrannical military culture and see all other creatures as fodder for their expansion. Vile Sakils move through the ethereal plane as well, seeping out from the nightmare realm of Zibalba to torment the mortal world. These are far from the only creatures lurking in the mists, however. Ether elementals twist and dance in places where the elemental planes brush close to the ethereal plane. Mighty etheric dragons lurk in secluded holdings, and phase spiders spin their twisted web settlements when not battling against their zill enemies. The strange alien creatures known as the Callborn, some of whom entered the material world of Galarian during the Age of Creation, are also native to the ethereal plane, and they can be found here in secret alien cities, sifting memories and secrets from mortal emotions. The only divinity to make her home in the strange realm is an obscure deity known as Alazra, the Dream Eater, a patron of night hags who has long dwelled on the ethereal plane to be closer to the dreams of mortals and gods alike. Thank you so much for watching that. That was Planar Cosmology 101 and the Transitive Planes. Coming up in this series, I'm going to be going over the four elemental planes, and then I'm going to be doing a video about the positive energy plane, the negative energy plane, the shadow dimension, and the first world, all that coming out in this series. If you enjoyed this content today, be sure to like and subscribe. If you've got special requests, let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you next time.